Good morning and welcome to worship on this second Sunday in Easter. Uh, you know, every day as Christians, we celebrate the new life of Christ through Christ's resurrection. And yet during the Easter season, we set aside 50 days of our church year in order to give special emphasis on the new life that Jesus gives us through our baptism. And we are only one week into that time, those 50 days. And so I hope you'll just focus on letting that celebration continue to happen from week to week. Uh, I just have a couple of announcements today. Um, the first one is every week we've been having a focus time for our Tuesday evening prayer. And this week we're going to focus on giving praise or giving thanks that's thanks for specific people or situations, whatever's been on your mind, the ways that you have seen God at work and very much alive in our world. That covers a whole lot of territory. So I hope you'll just go ahead and start your list and get them into me by Tuesday at five o'clock and I will include them during that prayer time. Secondly, um, now is the time if you would like to participate in a Bible study on the book of Acts. It will be a Zoom study. Um, and at one church, we had already planned on setting aside six weeks for an in-person study on the book of Acts. And now we're just going to be moving it online. And Pastor Molly now needs to practice in order to be able to smoothly facilitate a Zoom meeting. And whenever I've got all those little pieces in place, I'll let you know when we can do a little test and then we'll start that study. Your prayers are welcome for that process. <laughs> That's it for my announcements today. Um, as you can see, I've already lighted the candles behind me here at St. Paul. And now it's time for you to light your own candles at your home if you haven't done so already. So let's prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for worship as we listen to the prelude as Vanessa plays.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the good shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day, you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the water in this font, and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty, and give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. We'll now read Psalm 16 responsively. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their names upon my lips. O God, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's time for the children's sermon, and today I don't have any props. I could use my hands. No jelly beans, no snow globe, no lemons or anything. But what I have is a question for you. How do you tell that you are alive? Well, a good place to start is, <gasps> you know you're alive when you breathe, right? I know I'm alive when I can feel happy or sad, when I feel warm, or cold. I know I'm alive when I touch or I see, I can hear or I can think. There are all different ways that we can know that we are alive. But how do you tell that someone else is alive? There's a man in our lesson for today named Thomas and Thomas had a problem. Thomas knew that he was alive but he had trouble believing that Jesus was alive. And he had decided that the only way that he could tell Jesus was alive was by touching him. So when Jesus came into the room to visit the disciples, Thomas looked at him and still couldn't believe his eyes. He wasn't sure that Jesus had been resurrected. And Jesus let him come very, very close and he invited him to touch him. And that's when Thomas believed. Jesus said it would have been even better if Thomas had believed without seeing and to have faith. Well, now, what if Thomas had been blind? What if he couldn't see? 
Touching Jesus would have been a way for Thomas to know that Jesus was there. So I want you to close your eyes right now and touch someone next to you. It could even be your dog or cat. And if you don't have anybody next to you yet, I'm gonna give you permission to open your eyes just a little bit and go find someone and touch them. Close your eyes again and find that person's hand and hold their hand that's next to you. Squeeze that person's hand, not too hard. And doesn't it feel good to touch someone or hold their hand or hug someone? You can, you can open your eyes again. You know, maybe that's what Thomas was trying to tell Jesus. He needed a hug. When you have trouble believing Jesus is really alive, try holding someone's hand or reach out and hug them. It makes it a whole lot easier for you in order to stop your doubting and believe. And I have just another word for our teens or almost teens. I'm gonna invite you this week to be looking around and seeing the ways that Jesus is alive. Now, how do you do that? You look for the examples. Did one person in your household, for example, give you a hug today? That's an example of Jesus living through us and being alive in our lives. Were you kind to a friend this past week or a classmate or a family member? You know, for example, did you listen? Maybe someone was getting tired and they were complaining or they were sharing with you. Did you listen? Did you look outside? Maybe you saw a parent or a child going for a walk. Or did you walk your dog or feed the animals? It's in all of these little things, when we see one person helping another, that allows Jesus to be living through what we do. And Jesus is alive through our believing in him. Let's pray. Be with us, Jesus, now and always. And we ask that you would fill us with your love and show us how to love others. Amen. The risen Jesus appears to his disciples, offering them a benediction, a commission, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But one of their number is missing, and his unbelief prompts another visit from the Lord. The Holy Gospel is according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. 
Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you viewed our Easter service last week, um, which was recorded at both churches, and somebody asked me, you know, why at St. James were you recording in horizontal or landscape mode, you know, like this, and at St. Paul, you had switched to vertical or portrait mode? Well, I'm going to show you now. Look what happens in horizontal mode. Jesus' head gets cut off. The head of the statue of Jesus, you can't see his head. But if I move this, I'll try to do it carefully. When I get it to where we can see Jesus' head, now you can barely see what's below my head. So I'm going to go back to the vertical mode or the portrait mode where you can see both the top of Jesus' head as well as you can see me. Things are not always what they appear to be, are they? You know, our eyes have a way of playing tricks on us, especially when we are in selfie mode. When we're in selfie mode, our focus on Jesus gets cut off, if we're not careful. The celebration of Christ is risen, the Alleluia. It can get muddled and confused if all of our bandwidth is going to ourselves. When we are in selfie mode, it's like our priorities have flipped and our whole lives are running backwards. For example, when we're in a state of worrying, our eyes end up moving away from possibilities, in trust, in faith in Christ, and instead we can get stuck in despair and want to stay behind closed doors. Now, in ordinary time, it might have been enough to keep Jesus nearby, where we could call on him when we needed him. We may have found our faith to be strong enough to face whatever was coming along. Yet challenging times, whatever they may be, the greater amount of focus is needed then. We need more space for faith. More space is needed for us to develop that relationship with Jesus and to keep us from being taken over by that greater level of anxieties and worries and doubts. Oh, my. And I really wonder if that's where Thomas was during this part of the story from John. I would say that Thomas was experiencing a time of selfie mode and the other disciples were as well. I mean, who wouldn't be? I certainly don't blame them. They'd become very, very closed in. They are <clears throat> literally hiding behind closed doors to keep from being killed because of being followers of Jesus. I mean, it was truly an extraordinary time. And it's during this time of crisis that Jesus comes to them. This is the time when he makes his visits. And he greets them in calm and peace. And then he leaves that peace behind. He leaves behind that Holy Spirit and breathes the peace right on them and into them so they can feel it. In fact, it's a peace that lingers in the air after he is gone until the next time. And so they are reassured by Jesus' presence, any doubts, any fears, they were gone. They just seemed to have vanished. And then we have Thomas. He was the one who was left out. He was the one left behind and missed the experience of a lifetime. I mean, I assume, like the other disciples, Thomas had no doubt heard Mary give her report when she said, I have seen the Lord. Thomas wasn't there with her, so how could he believe? 
And Thomas had just heard from all the other disciples, we have seen the Lord, but Thomas wasn't there. So how could he believe? So you see that common theme starting to build here, right? The others had a more direct route to believe. They were present with Jesus, alive. Which caused Thomas to say, in effect, until I get the same chance as the rest of you to see and to hear and to feel Jesus alive, how can I know that your eyes aren't just playing tricks on you? I want to touch him so that I can know that he is alive. And from then on, some people have labeled him as Doubting Thomas. And I've always thought that that is a really bad rap. <laughs> and I, have, I like to think of him differently because of one time. And that is before Jesus' death on the cross. Thomas was the one, remember the story about Lazarus. Thomas was the one who I've always thought of as a super disciple because he was out there campaigning with the other disciples to get them to be courageous. He's the one out there saying, man up, you guys, let's go with Jesus to Bethany, even though we know it might mean our death. Let's die with him. Thomas, in my eyes, is the ever faithful one. During a time when scripture has painted the other disciples lots of times in other flattering and non-flattering light. There was Peter, the rock. Remember, my goodness, he had times of doubt and times of denial. Others were power hungry or they were slow in trying to understand what Jesus was teaching. And my goodness, there was Judas, the one who renders the ultimate betrayal. So for me, it's always had greater meaning that Thomas is the one. He's the disciple with the greatest doubts after Jesus is resurrected, even though he had the fewest doubts while Jesus was alive. He says perhaps what we might have wanted to say or to be asking, to be talking about if we had been in that situation ourselves. And when he is finally present with Jesus, Thomas doesn't even get a single word out. Before Thomas gets a word out, Jesus has already invited him to do more than just speak to him or to see his wounds like the others had. Jesus invites Thomas to go ahead and touch him. That's when Thomas knows that Jesus is alive. And here is where I think the gospel writer John really helps all of us out. Those of us who became Christians years later. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's you. That's me. Centuries later after Jesus' resurrection. And John ended this entire episode with a blanket statement that I think still inspires people today. I'm including all of these things, the signs, and this episode with Thomas so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God, and that through believing in him, you may have new life in his name. His new life isn't limited to only the ones who were there. So it shifts our having to have been physically there to see Jesus or touch him like the other disciples, or to have literally heard his voice like Mary had. And for us, fear and doubt are transformed into hope by believing in Jesus, believing in his resurrection. It's extraordinary. He passed the peace on through his breath and through the Holy Spirit. And you know, at first, you know, the disciples lived in great fear and they were overtaken by times of hopelessness. They were behind the closed doors and closed themselves off to the world. And now more than ever, I think we can relate to that. During this time when we are physically apart, uh, you may be feeling a need to be closing down, becoming inside yourself. 
just like the disciples. But the visits that Jesus made to the disciples gave him courage once again to be filled with hope and to reach out to others. And now we can be hopeful as well because of our believing in Jesus, the resurrected Christ. And now we can be hopeful too in how our time physically apart seems to be working and that it is saving lives. So thank you for continuing to do that. But whether we are physically together or apart through the Holy Spirit, we can always connect to Christ at any time and we can connect to each other through him. By shifting our focus from ourselves, our selfie mode, and toward Christ, we can look to Jesus' face. We can see his outstretched hands and sides, scarred from wounds of the cross, but not broken forever. By believing that Jesus is risen, we have new life in his name and experience Jesus' peace, and it's only a breath away. Through his presence, we can be strong and courageous, energized and inspired. Through his teachings in the scripture, we can be built up through our prayers and we can reach out to others, sharing the good news of new life through Jesus. So are you ready? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all places and time in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Open the doors that we close, O oh God, when we fear those who seem more like strangers than friends. Guide us to unity and harmony so that we may come to respect and cherish all neighbors, knowing that you love all of your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open the rooms that we lock, O oh God, to those who live without a homeland or a place of safety. Help us to reach out to those who are homeless or hungry or are in trouble and help us to seek peace and understanding between all nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open the hearts we close, O God, to the cries of those in pain. We pray for those isolated physically or emotionally through incarceration, addiction, mental illness, chronic suffering, or grief. We pray for those isolated because of the coronavirus, those in intensive care units, hospitals, or quarantined at home. We pray for the injured or sick, those with cancer, disability, or disease, that they may feel your protective hands laid upon their bodies, your healing hands on their minds, and their hearts. And listen to our prayers now as we lift those individuals who are on our minds and our hearts, asking for your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open the ways of love, O oh God, in the pursuit of peace throughout the world. Bless the efforts of missionaries, healthcare, and all essential workers. 
for relief workers and those in the armed forces, for those who are unemployed or separated from family, for those who find themselves in harm's way, and for the well-being of all children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open the way to eternal life, O God, as we remember those who have died in faith. Free us from the fear of death, that we embrace the peace that you have promised. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Share God's peace with each other now. We continue with our offering, and for our offering today, uh, it has to do with what I asked the teens to do earlier in the children's sermon. Uh, think of a couple ways that you have seen Christ alive in your world during this week, Christ alive in your own life and through others, and then give thanks for that person, that place, or situation. Let us pray. Merciful God, our ordinary gifts seem small for such a celebration, but you make of them an abundance, just as you do with our lives. Now send us forth to share the gifts of Easter with all in need, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ has risen, just as he said. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. We now close with the sending hymn, Blessed Assurance, followed by a postlude. 